once again, everybody. It's so good to see everyone. We want to welcome everyone else that's watching online. Can we give a big, big round of applause for those that are watching online? Am I on? Good. Awesome. It's so good to see you all. I tell you, it's been awesome to see actual faces here together. I love being online, and uh, we understand, we respect those that choose not to come as a result of what's going on. But I tell you, there's nothing like being in the house being together. So thank you so much for seeing everybody. It's so good to see everybody. Hi, my name is Eric Bucci. I'm the lead pastor here at the Cornerstone Church. And so if this is your first time joining with us either here in the room or online, I want to personally welcome you and let you know something so important, how important you are to God, that you matter to God. You actually matter to God. Your life is not an accident. You're here for a reason. And we really believe that. We're passionate because God is passionate for you. He really is. And I, um, today we're going to be talking about something that uh, I think a lot of people struggle with. And we're going to be talking about depression and, and how to deal with uh, undepressing in the wilderness. And we go through difficult times. And I have to be transparent with you this morning. I, um, it's been a, a rough couple of days for me not because it's about me, because I care about the people God entrusts us with here at Cornerstone. And I'm not at liberty to give uh, too much uh, explanation, but we have a dear friend of ours uh, that is dying of cancer in hospice right now. And my heart is heavy. And uh, I have to be honest with you today, it's heavy. And I don't have a liberty to share who it is, but I want to pray every service and honor this wonderful woman of God uh, who's going through a difficult time and the family's going through a difficult time. Uh, they, they're believers. I know, I know she's going to go home with the Lord, but I want to just give God an opportunity to bring healing upon her. We believe God heals, and I've seen God heal in the past. I've seen God heal of cancer. I've seen God do it. And nothing's too difficult for him. I can't control it, but I, I pray and I ask God. So would you join me as we pray for this wonderful woman of God? Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the grave could not hold you down. That the same spirit that rose you from the dead resides in us believers. And Lord, we turn our attention to this lovely woman right now that is in hospice, unless you move miraculously, unless you supernaturally intervene in her body, Lord, she's going to be coming home soon with you. But Lord, we're asking God, if at all, Lord, we're asking that you'd bring healing upon her in Jesus' name, that you'd rise her up from that bed and that she would have more work and more blessing to dispense as she's been doing for such a long time. I thank you for her, God. I pray you bless her family in Jesus' name. And Father, as we sang today, as we sang today, you were the one that goes through us in the fire, standing next to us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would do that in her life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, I want to say something important to you about healing and all that. I understand that it's a lot easier just to say, well, God doesn't heal today. That was the Old Testament. That was the New Testament. And God doesn't do that anymore today. And it's easier to say that. You know why? Because if I believe in my heart he doesn't heal anymore today, then I won't be disappointed. The truth is, God does heal today. I don't understand why he does some and others he does not. I don't understand. But my default setting is always to believe God for healing. And I've seen God do miraculous healings. I've seen it happen. And so I think it's important that we, we trust God and believe God and, and continue to pray for God to do a work. I, was, I had a privilege of meeting with a pastor, my wife and I, before this pandemic happened, went to Florida, spent about 12 other pastors and, and uh, Rob Ketterling, who passes an amazing church in, and, um, in Michigan, I'm in mean, Minneapolis, excuse me. And he shared that his son struggled with autism for like 13, 14 years. I mean, it was to the point, it was embarrassing. He had a hard time controlling him. He couldn't really uh, interact with people. He's praying and praying and praying for years and years and years and years. One day, a woman in the church came up to him and said, uh, and said I think, believe God's going to heal your son today. He prayed. He was healed. Free of autism. Went to college. Amazing. So listen, I don't know why certain things happen, why they do and why they don't. But I know this, our God's able. And you know what? I'm not God and neither are you. We need to give God opportunity to do that. And so that's what I'm talking about a little bit right now as we're dealing with that situation. Well, today we're talking about undepressing in the wilderness. 
That's today. But before we do that, I want to thank you all for your faithful giving. And we've been able to have over four blood drives at Red. We're having another blood drive to help the Red Cross. They're having a hard time getting blood because of the pandemic and all that. So thank you, thank you, thank you for, your, for you coming here, getting blood taken and, and your faithful giving. And I also want to thank you for rescuing little children off the streets from sex trafficking as we support the wonderful Project Rescue Ministry, one of the many missionaries we support. Thank you for being a part of that. We're making a difference together. There's so many other things that we're doing. So thank you for that. And if you want to continue to give, you don't have to give everybody. We don't force anyone to give. But if you'd like to give to, uh, to, our, to the ministry here at Cornerstone Church, there's several different ways you can do it. At the end of the service today, there are boxes in the back. There's also, you can text to 77977 to give our push pay app or give online to cornerstonecheshire.com or the old-fashioned snail mail. You know, you actually put a, like an envelope and you mail it. You can do that too as well or just send it that way. So, Father, I pray you bless the offering. I thank you for the people that are trusting you. Lord, we thank you. You promise that you said you would supply all of our needs, not all of our greeds, but you said our needs in you. If we trust you, what you've enabled us to have in Jesus' name, amen. Let's get back to what we're talking about today undepressing in the wilderness. You see, I don't know about you, but depression is one of the biggest problems we're facing in our culture today. The number one prescribed medication in America today are antidepressants, hands down, or more than drug, high blood pressure medication. In any other medication right now, it's the number one thing. It is. It is an epidemic in our society, and during this pandemic, it has even risen, uh, risen to a higher level. And unfortunately, I've known some people that have lost the battle with depression over this past year. And uh, so, you know, it's an issue. What do we do to overcome it? God has a plan for us. But the first thing I want to let you know is it's real. It's real. Whether you think so or not, it's real. Now, with that being said, I've done some studies about depression this past week. What does this have to do with depression? Well, obviously... The cat's depressed and the dog's not. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I found something out through my research this past week. It was fascinating. Did you know? Did you know? It's always good to taste the sweet in life. You know, to find the good thing. How many people like ice cream? Thank God for ice cream, right? And pizza and cookies. And oh, thank God. I wish it didn't stick to me so easily, but it does. But, you know, to taste the sweet and thank God for the sweet. You know what I found out this past week? I did not know this. Do you realize that cats don't have the ability to taste sweet? Cats can't taste ice cream or sugar. They can't. I just found this out. Now you know why the cats are so nasty <laughs> and why dogs are so happy. Dogs can taste sweet. So you learn something today. But many of us feel like this. We don't taste the sweet. And sometimes when you're going through depression, you lose the ability to taste and, and I would say to you that depression is a real issue in our society today. It's a, called a new disorder characterized by an, an anhedonia, which is simply the, um, the ability not to have the ability to feel pleasure, happiness anymore. It, it's an extreme sadness, poor concentration, sleep problems, loss of appetite, and feelings of guilt, helplessness, and hopelessness. And I'd say depression and anxiety are very close. They're almost identical twins. They kind of feed on each other. And I, I confess to you that growing up, I always thought, oh, those are weak people. Yeah, they're not weak. And especially in the church, by the way. I had a dear friend of mine, David Ferranti. His wife suffers at times from clinical depression. She did. She's doing a lot better now. And this is what she said. She said to me, she said that le uh, depression and anxiety is the leprosy of the church. Many people in the church don't take it seriously. Because, you know, hey, just lift your hands and worship. God's good. And what's wrong with you? Where's your faith, right? You, have to have, you need to have faith. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And if you're going through depression, it's difficult. And I want to explain to you what's a little bit what it's like. That I, I struggled myself. I never could understand what people were going through until it hit me. When I was like 22 years old, it hit me. And I had no idea what hit me. And I, was, I, was, I didn't get any medical help. I battled through it. I suffered needlessly, and then I began to realize, wow, this is really real, and I thank God that I went through it. I don't want to go through it again, but I went through a season of my life, my early 20s, where it was like, I didn't believe in God anymore. It's like, where's God? 
and I lost all the ability to have joy, and I literally, I hoped a bus would hit me. I, I wasn't like gonna take my life, but if, God, if I died, I'd be okay with me. That's how I felt. I hated life. It was painful. I wanted out. Thank God I got through it. But never in my life have I ever experienced that before. I always can, you know, get over it. Go for a run, get a, you know, go watch a movie or something and shake it off, I'd be fine. But man, this thing wouldn't have stopped for days, months. Over almost a year, I faced it. And, uh, and I say that to you because, not because I, it's all about me, it's not. But I'm gonna let you know, many of you don't experience it. I wanna explain to you a little bit what it's like. How many of you like Thanksgiving? Except for the crazy in-laws and outlaws and the crazy uncle that says the wrong things. Sometimes I've been that uncle. Anyhow, so, uh, and if you don't know anyone that's that way in your family, you're probably that person. <laughs> but but I, I remember, uh, imagine if you go to Thanksgiving, it's a beautiful, there's no pandemic, there's turkey, there's deep fried turkey, which is the best, right? And for all you vegetarians out there, it's tofu. Okay, so you're having a good time. All your family's there that you like and you want to be around. There's football. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic time. And imagine that. And then imagine all of a sudden you get the stomach bug. And you're vomiting. And you have a fever, 103. You have cramps. And you, you can't eat. You, you can't. And someone to come up to someone that has a stomach virus and say, hey, what's your problem? You got a beautiful family. There's a deep fried turkey here. You look, look at all. What's wrong with you? Come on, enjoy your family. Sit down. Enjoy the meal. What's wrong with you? Now, would we do that to somebody that has a stomach virus and vomiting? Of course not. But do you realize people that experience clinical depression and anxiety, it's like that. It may, life may be perfect in every capacity according to you and I, but their brain has a sprain. Their brain is going through a difficult time. They have a chemical imbalance. It could, yeah, it's spiritual. Everything's spiritual, everybody. And, and, and listen, you're not a bad person if you're depressed. In fact, I'll say it's okay not to be okay. You probably heard that phrase. It's true. And I pray that Cornerstone, we can be a place where we can be real. You want to tell everyone, but to find somebody. If you're struggling with your, your sexual identity or you're struggling with depression or whatever it is, we have news for you. God is a God of healing. God's a God of new beginnings, whatever you're going through. If you're going through a physical illness or, or a mental illness or whatever, it is not, you're not a bad person because you're sick. And we have to stop, everybody, making people feel bad. People came up to me, praise and worship, I lift your hands to the Lord. I wanted to slap somebody for saying that to me. Now, does praise and worship help? Absolutely, but when you're so throwing up, the last thing you need to tell someone when they're throwing up, here, have some turkey, have some turkey, have some, have some pumpkin pie. I don't care how much you like it. Leave me alone. I can't eat right now. And there are times you are so down and you're so out, you can't even pray. And guess what? God's okay with that. Just like a parent. You're okay with your kid? They're sick and they're throwing up and they can't even eat? Of course. So is God. So first of all, it's okay not to be okay. And I thank God the Bible is really real. And talks about people suffering through the wilderness of depression. You see, I like what Stephen said, the author of Depression Cure. And this is what he says. Our society, we are running at an unsustainable pace. We're not designed to live like we're living right now. And it's causing more problems. You know the number one killer from young adults from 13 to 25? It's not motor vehicle accidents anymore. It's suicide. That's right. See, we were never designed for the sedentary, indoor, oh, hello, socially isolated, fast food laden, sleep deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. We are not designed to live this way. And you break the design, you break you. You see, we have cell phones, social media, lack of identity, inability to process a pain. Peer-to-peer -peer mentoring is sometimes the worst thing to do when you're going through something. Nar narcissistic generation. You know what narcissism does? It's a self-eating disease. When you live for yourself, it causes more struggle and more difficulty. You see, suicide is a permanent, irreversible attempt to solve a temporary problem. And if you're going through right now a rough day and you're wondering, can I even go forward? Hang on better days are coming. I don't care how bad it is, it will get better. 
And for those in Christ Jesus, you hear me say it all the time. It's my, one of my things that I'll say to my dying day. The best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. You got to believe that. You got to know that. So suicide is, is a permanent, irreversible attempt to solve a temporary problem. <laughs> and you don't have to die to end your pain. And I, I, listen, guys, this is real. We need to be there for people. We need to be real with people that are going through difficult times. In fact, I just want to put this up here because I, it just, it's so important. I want to screenshot this and, well, where's, where's your faith in God? I have faith in God, but I still eat. I have faith in God. You know, you've heard the old saying, imagine if you will, you're in a flood and the, you're on the top of a roof of a house and the flood's coming up. You're going to die. Like, God, rescue me, God. Save me. I believe you will. And, they, and all of a sudden, uh, a boat comes and says, come and get in the boat. No, no, no. God's going to rescue me, right? And then a helicopter comes and it says, no, 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 no. God's going to rescue me. And then you die. You go to God, God, why don't you rescue me? I sent the boat. I sent the helicopter. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. And so take advantage of what he gives us. And so this is a, I want to encourage you to put that down just in case you know somebody that's struggling. It's a real issue. Unfortunately, I, I have known someone this past year that, uh, that, that came under this and they're long, no longer with us during this crisis. And I'm hearing about it more and more. We're not designed to live in isolation. It's unhealthy. It's as bad as the virus in many ways. It is. So, yeah, we need to be smart, but this is not good. So that's why I, I say physically distant, but not, not socially distancing. And so we're going to look at a great man in the Bible. His name is Ahab. <laughs> Ahab's a terrible man. He was an evil king that had a lovely wife by the name of Jezebel who pulled the strings behind the scenes. Wicked woman. And there was a, a prophet by the name of Elijah. We talked about him several weeks ago. Remember we talked about Elijah and the drought and all that. I'm going to go there right now. But God experienced amazing things through Elijah. And it didn't rain for three and a half years, and there was a wicked kingdom there. And then God raised up Elijah. He came back, and he told, he said, I'm going to have a showdown against the prophets of Baal. So they had 450 prophets of Baal came together at a Mount Carmel area, and they had a, they had a showdown at the old corral. And he said, call on your God to, to, to light the fire of the sacrifice. So the prophets of Baal were cutting themselves, trying to make God move. And you know what happened to him? He called down fire. The fire came, destroyed, and consumed the sacrifice. They killed 450 prophets. It was a great victory. Here is a guy that was in the wilderness for three and a half years. He comes out. He has great victory. He overcomes the enemy. He's thinking, phenomenal. We finally get out of this pandemic. I finally, my marriage is healed. I got out of this cancer. Whatever you, you, you come out the other side. You've done well. You, you've, you've come to the other side. The storm is in. There is a new sunny day before you. According to studies, sometimes the, 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 the most vulnerable you are is after great success. After winning the World Series, if you will. So what happens? When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. She is demonic. Intimidation, manipulation, control. It's so hard when there's people behind the scenes pulling the strings, and that's actually where she was. May the God strike me and even kill me by this time tomorrow if I have not killed you just as you've killed them. So Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He was what? Afraid. Fear. Fear. And fled for his life. He went to Beersheba down in Judah and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone. Sometimes the worst thing you can do when you're depressed is get by yourself because you are your worst counselor when you're down. Your negative thoughts can bring you into a place of lathering up despair. And into the wilderness, traveling all day, he sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. Talk about manic. We go from the high of the high to the lowest of the lowest. I've had enough. Have you ever said that? I cannot take one more day in this marriage. I cannot take one more day, my parents. I cannot take one more day in this job. I cannot take one more day. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. All this work I've done, everything I've tried to do, it all has come 
to not. Think about it. He had a tremendous success. How much more success can you have than killing 450 prophets of Baal in a supernatural way? And it didn't stick. It didn't matter. You've done everything you can do for this marriage. You've done everything you can do to get through the situation. And it's all falling apart. And this is what he's going through. I'm no better off. So what do we do during depressive thinking? Often it's faulty thinking. As a man thinks, he shall become. Our, our mind is a gateway. Our mind is the doorway that enters your mind and goes to your soul and your spirit. The Bible says take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ because your thoughts matter. Faulty thinking. We want to go to faithful thinking. We spoke last week about this. We spoke about seeing the problem versus seeing the promise, right? And I want you to get that in you. Am I seeing the problem over the promise or the promise in the problem? If you find the promise in every problem, you'll get through the problem. And the promise is, I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. The promise is all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purposes. We have to find the promise in every problem. It says in Philippians, fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, and pure, and lovely. That means you don't turn on the news. <laughs> okay. Especially right. How many can't wait till this season's over behind us? Oh, Lord, help us. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Then the God of peace will be with you. So depressive thinking, we have faulty thinking, and we have isolation. We get all by myself. Sometimes that's the worst thing to do. There are times to get by yourself, but you need to get help. Do not go by yourself at times. You see, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Leave me alone. I'm going by myself to stew, to think about everything wrong. My friends, it's so important that there's times to isolate, but most of the time you and I are designed to be together. We're not designed to be by ourselves. Anytime there's life in nature, in molecular structure, it takes at least two elements to create life. An egg, a seed, molecules. It takes two molecules interacting for a reaction. Without another, you don't have reaction. It's important. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit work together. Even the chairs you're sitting on right now, there are molecules interacting with each other that are causing the solid that, that you can sit where you are. It's two or three gathered in my name. I'm in the midst of them. Do not forsake the gathering together as some of you made the habit of doing, lest you fall away. We're not designed to be by ourselves. There are seasons for isolation, but not long term. So he left his servant there. It says in Ecclesiastes, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three, or even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. There's power when we gather together. Maybe one horse can do 7,000 pounds. You'd think two horses would be 14. No, it could be like 25,000 pounds. There's something about unity that brings power. God has designed it that way. And this is how we're going to overcome this issue that we're going through. You need to find godly men and women to stand alongside of you through this process. So we have faulty thinking, isolation. Here's another one. Led by our feelings. Right now, our society has made feelings everything. Well, I feel, therefore, it's true. Your feelings will lie to you. Feelings are wonderful at times. Feelings, as I said before, are terrible masters. They're terrible masters. Truth should be your master, not your feelings. Because your feelings will come and they will go. In 1 King 19, 1 through 4, it says this. I, and, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. He felt terrible. His feelings were terrible at that time. You know what Jesus says about how to overcome your feelings? You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And the truth is not just an idea. The truth is Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. You see, truth is Jesus actualized. You will know the truth, not your feelings. There are times you're going to feel like giving up, but you can't give up. And, and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, 
for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. He was comparing himself to others now. So not only was he led by feelings, but his comparisons. Nothing good comes out of comparisons. It's good not to compare yourself because you'll think you're better or not as good as somebody. Faulty thinking, isolation, led by feelings. And in Galatians, as the Apostle Paul says this, he says, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but God, if pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. God does not call you to compare yourself to other people. You're the only one that you can be. In fact, it's important that we realize that because if you live by comparing yourself, and nothing, nothing feeds us more than social media. I mean, someone just, just did a brand new kitchen. You're like, Really? How did she lose all that weight? Where did she get those lips from? <laughs> what happened to him? You know, and you look at that, and you know, you're sitting there, you're, you, know, you can barely get through the day, and they're like in, they're like in some, some beautiful desert island someplace. Anyhow, move on. And you can compare yourself, and you can start comparing yourself to other people. Do you realize how long it took to get that shot? The person was sitting there for a couple of hours. <laughs> All day long trying to get that right. And then they buy a filter that I bought a filter that I can make my teeth whiter. <laughs> and I can actually take my chin in more. So if I look better online, there's a reason why. <laughs> then, as the story goes on, then he lay down and slept. Sometimes the best thing you and I can do is lay down and sleep. Not in church. I never forget when I was in college, uh, I decided to drive from Long Island, New York, all the way to Springfield, Missouri, at our Evangel University. I drove it all by myself, did not stop at all except to use the restroom and get gas. I drove straight. I don't know what I was thinking. So I got in the car and I kept drinking cold, uh, Jolt Cola. If you don't know what that is, double the sugar, double the caffeine. And I just downed that and I kept driving, 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 driving. I got to the university. I, I got into my dorm room. The RA said something to me. I called my dad up, said, Dad, I'm quitting this university. They're a bunch of legalistic idiots. I'm out of here. I can't stand this in school anymore. I'm done. I'm coming home. My dad said, have you slept yet? No. He says, take it. Go to bed and call me tomorrow like a good doctor. So I, I hung up the phone. I went to bed. 13 hours later, I woke up. And I was like, what was I bothered by? When you're tired and exhausted, you can't think straight. And it's important that we get sleep. That, you know, God has made our bodies, everybody. It affects you. What happens to your body affects your mind, affects your spirit. So he lay down and slept under a broom tree. As he was sleeping, an angel touched him. God's presence said, get up and eat. Can I hear an Amen. Hallelujah, I'm not going to eat yet though, okay? He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on the hot stones of jar. He had brick oven wood fire pizza. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. Huh? How about this? Fresh bread. Not with olive oil. With salted whipped butter. Come on, everybody, come on. They're nothing like butter and bread. Melted butter on fresh bread. That's not, that has gluten in it. <laughs> All right. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked in hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank. And here, here's something spiritual. And he lay down again. Can I hear an Who wants to get this and put it on their dashboard? <laughs> What'd you learn today in church? I, I, I ate, I lay down again. Sometimes the best thing you can do is lay down again. You know what? God has us to have one day of rest. Every week. We designed that for us. If you violate the Sabbath, the Sabbath will violate you. You're not designed to go 24-7, uh, seven days a week, 365. You're, you need to stop. Have one day where you don't do your normal job and focus on the Lord and get rest. That's important. And sleep, but not in church. So we ate and drank and lay down again. Then an angel of the Lord came again. God's presence. As, you know, when you, when you get yourself rested up, you can hear from God better. Because your body's working. Everything's working. When you're, when you're tired and hungry, you can't think straight. The angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up. I love this. This is so awesome. It sounds like an Italian mom. Get up and eat some more. Have more. Have more. Or, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. In other words, get healthy. Get sleep. Eat right. Have the right kind of diet. 
that, that affects you spiritually as well. You cannot, the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have to take care of our bodies. You can't separate everybody. So he got up oh, and he ate and drank and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Take care of your body. Get enough sleep. Get the right diet. How are some steps to healing? Go to a place where you can hear God, God's presence. There's something about coming together. I love being online. Don't get me wrong. But man, there's something when the whole team's up here and I, I see people worshiping God together. There's something in the room that touches me, the presence of God. You know, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst of that. We worship it. Get in his presence. Saturate yourself. And go to a place where you hear God. And maybe by yourself, maybe find that armchair in the basement. Find that place in a park. Find that place alone with your car, with your windows open, where you can be by yourself. And you can hear, hear from God. Go to a place where you can hear God. Experience God's presence is so powerful. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, as he got by himself, the Lord asked him, the Lord had dialogue with him. What are you doing here, Elijah? God knew what was going on. You know, God cares about what you are. God wants to know you. He cares about you. Pour out your heart to God. God, I feel like trash. God, I want to leave him or her. God, I want to give up. God, I don't even want to live anymore. But God, this is how I feel. Tell God how you feel. Any relationship worth its weight has an interaction of true feelings and thoughts. God's okay. Pour out your heart to him. You see it throughout the scriptures. Pour out your heart to him. Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. Almost all of that's true, except for that last phrase. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. This is what the enemy always does. You're the only one going through this. No one has the marriage you have. No one has the young adult experience you have. No one has the teenage experience you have. No one is experiencing what you're, you're the only one. And 1 Corinthians 10, 15, 10, 13 says, no temptation is overtaking you but what is common to man. And one of the tricks of the enemy is to tell you, you're the only one going through this. One of the beautiful things of this pandemic, if you can call it that, is we're all in this together. Praise God, right? You're not the only one. All right, uh, uh, I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And what does God tell them to do? Go out and stand before me in the mountain. Stay in my presence in the place where I am. Fill yourself. Get into a location where you hear from God. If it's, if it's your armchair in the basement, if it's a car in the park, if it's here at church, get to a place where you hear from God. I've, I've, I've actually talked to a gentleman in our church. He says, during worship, I don't know what happens, but I get, I, I, I'm sitting there focusing on God, and all of a sudden I'll get these downloads from God. Well, God said to him, I want, you to, I want you to buy a home and rent it. So he did that, and that ended up being the income he needed. It's pretty cool. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. It was such a terrible blast, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. You see, we have to quiet everything down. Put the phone away. Turn off the data. Turn off Caleb and put your chicken sandwich down. <laughs> Just stop trying. Stop with all the media. Turn it all down. Some of you are afraid to get by yourself. Say, God, I want to hear your voice and the sound of a gentle whisper. So go to a place where you hear God, God's presence. Pour out your heart to him. Listen for the whisper. Get rid of distractions. Be still. For me, getting in nature does it for me. I, 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 I love the ocean. I love it. I just watch the nature, and the nature speaks to me. No, I'm not into new age. What I'm saying is God's creation speaks of his character. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted on the earth. 
And then number four, fill yourself with God's word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Get yourself saturated with God's word. You can listen to audio Bible if you can't read. There's so many things available to you. Be filled with the Lord. And when you get God's word in you, it changes you. It absolutely changes. Every day, I, just, I read this morning uh, through the book of Nehemiah. I'm going through the Bible in a year. I've been doing it for 20 years. I love it. And the Lord spoke to me through Nehemiah this morning. When Nehemiah kept reminding God of the promises, he told him, God, I did this. God, will you hear me on my behalf? And I felt the Lord said to me, you need to come to me more with the promises I've given you and ask for a return on them because I will. And that was this morning. I got that this morning. And what happens is my ears percolate and I start to hear the Holy Spirit and it prepares me for the rest of my day. Every day getting into his presence. When Elijah heard it, he did something Dr. Fauci would be happy about. He wrapped his face in his cloak. <laughs> I found a way to put that in there. <laughs> Lighten up, okay? For you, get you. I can't believe you said. Lighten up, okay? He wrapped his face in his cloak. And he socialed it. No, I'm sorry. And he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And God will say, what are you doing? What are you worrying about? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord. Almighty, but people of Israel have broken down their covenant. He's repeating himself, which often happens. He even knows people that are depressed. There's no jobs out there. Ah, nah, nah. She does this. She does that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can, can't get a word in. And they've broken their covenant with you. And they turned on your altars and killed every one of your prophets. And I am the only one left. And, and now they're trying to kill me too. And God says, I ah, know you're not the only one left. There's 7,000 that have not bowed. Oh, no one's running the cameras today. I better stay within the frame. By the way, if you want to serve the Lord, we could use more camera people. I feel like I'm a dog in the backyard. On the, on the tra- I can't move. Okay, I'm Italian and German. I need to move. Okay. So I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Then the Lord said to him, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazel to be king of Aram. What happened? God had a plan for him. When you don't know what to do, start doing God's plan. God has a plan for you. You're not here just to exist, to be a consumer index, to help the GDP of America. No, God has a purpose for you and for me. And you'll never be satisfied if you're living for yourself. He gave, him a, he gave him marching orders. He said, anoint Jehu, the grandson of Nishma, to be king of Israel, and anoint Elijah. Find someone to mentor. Find someone to go through life with. And he began to spend time with Elijah, and Elijah superseded Elijah, did twice the amount of miracles. So what do we got to do? Go to a place where you can hear God, God's presence. It's so important. Pour out your heart to him. Listen for the whisper. Fill yourself with God's word. Let God give me a new purpose and direction for my life. That's why we have growth track today at 1 o'clock. I encourage you to come. We want to help you to get connected to Cornerstone. You can make a difference and run the cameras. Praise the Lord. And number six, perhaps one of the most important things I'm telling you right now. Focus on eternity with God. My friends, this is not heaven. It's not heaven. Focus on eternity. For the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. Didn't say for, for the joy of his disciples and how his ministry was. No, for the joy set before him, which is heaven, Christ endured. If Christ needed heaven to endure, you think maybe we might need it. Absolutely. You need to have your, your person. If you have not given your life to Jesus... There's no assurance of being with him forever, but a place of eternal torment of being separated from God. You can see what things are like without God. Focus on eternity with God. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So I say with you, confident, as I said to the person I spoke to that's dying, The best days are ahead for you in Christ Jesus.
best is ahead. It may be tough right now, but a better day is coming. There may be, there may be weeping in the evening, but joy comes in the morning. One day we will get to the place of heaven. We don't focus enough on heaven. You can be so heavenly focused that you're of earthly good. I love the serenity prayer. I heard this a couple of weeks ago. I never heard the complete prayer. I only heard part of it. I think this is worth a screenshot with your phone or whatever to go and pray this prayer. I think it's really good. Listen, look, I'm going to pray. Look, I'm going to read this prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time. Accepting hardship as the pathway to peace. This, in this world, you will have trouble, Jesus says. Taking as he did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will. That I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. Guys, it's the secret of every martyr. I've read the stories of martyrs. When the first martyr of the church, besides Jesus, there's Stephen, was, there were stones being hurled at him. He saw a vision of heaven. You and I need to have a vision of heaven. Do you have a vision of heaven? Have you given your life to Jesus? If you haven't, today's the day of salvation. And for all of us, I encourage you to do these things. Maybe go back and watch this later on again. I'm just sharing the word of God with you. But are you right with God? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? If you were to die right now, do you know you'd be with him forever? You can know that. And the beautiful thing, I tell you, I love it. I never get tired of telling you the good news. Here's the good news. Christ does it all for us. All we have to do is accept it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Every other religion, you have to work, work, work. Religion, you got to surrender. For Christianity, it's so much better because it's the truth. And you know it inside of you. So I'm going to ask you a question. Do you know God? I'm going to pray for all of us after that, but I want to give you an opportunity right now. If you haven't given your life to Christ, today's the day of salvation. I'm going to pray a prayer. If you'll enter into that prayer with your heart, today is a new day. Because Jesus paid the price that you could enter and follow him through. I'm going to ask you to bow your head, close your eyes, even if you're at home or wherever you're located. Repeat after me in your own heart, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Thank you for paying for all of the things I've ever done wrong. Right now, I ask you to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong both known and unknown. And I choose to turn away from what I know is wrong. Today, I declare, I resign my life to you. This is not my life anymore. I completely give my life the best way I know I have now. Lord, I give you my life right now. Take my life. It is yours. In Jesus' name, thank you that I am now your child. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or renewed that commitment, I want to encourage you to text BEGIN to 94090. Or tell someone at the end if you're here. Or go to the information desk. We have a Bible for you. We want to help you along the way. Listen, we're all on a journey together. The best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. For the rest of us, I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you to get in God's presence. I want to encourage you to pour out your heart to him. I want to encourage you to get with other believers. I want to encourage you to fill your mind with the things of God. And watch what God will do through your life and my life as we keep eternity always before us in Jesus' name. God bless you guys. Hey, listen, thank you so much for being attended today. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to the day we can start hugging each other again. So I'm going to give you a big mental hug. All right? God bless you guys.